Welcome everybody. My name is Mark Nutter, the Conservation Programs Director here at New Hampshire Audubon. I'd like to first acknowledge that this presentation is streaming to you from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the ancient village of Penacook in Nadakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnumbach, or human beings, who have stewarded Nadakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous peoples and get connected to resources to learn more. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, I'd invite you to check out all the resources at indigenousnh.com, including this interactive story map that details the indigenous presence and their stories here in New Hampshire. These resources, among others, have helped me recognize the ongoing consequences of colonialism for all people of color and the need for change in our current society. Thank you so much for your interest in tonight's topic, Becoming a Mother, presented by Jerry Skinner. I feel like I've under underappreciated moths my whole life, so I'm really interested in learning more about them alongside you this evening. And as you may know, this talk is the 10th session of a year-long webinar series called Exploring Connections to and Stewardship of the Natural World supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council's grant program. The past, of, past recordings of these excellent talks can be found on the New Hampshire Audubon YouTube page, which are linked on the series webpage where you found this, the registration for this uh, evening's um, talk. Throughout this series, we're exploring the intersection of the sciences and the humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. This particular talk is the sixth in a series of a total of nine talks focused on pollinator conservation. And we are delighted to have um, Jerry here with us this evening. However, before I hand it over to Jerry for tonight's presentation, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. For those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from National Audubon. We're actually older than National Audubon. And we rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars. The first of which is connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars and talks like these researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds, managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation, and finally, advocating for a sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. And I am here today because of members and donors like you. We also rely on a huge network of over 2,000 volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you are a volunteer member or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you'd like to become part of our conservation family, which I hope you will, please check out our website for ways to get involved. We do have over 60 people tuning in this evening so you'll see that we're in full webinar mode. That said, please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, and reactions you might have, and the Q&A button for any specific questions you'd like Jerry to answer. For fun, just try typing into the chat where you're watching this presentation from. It's been great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach through these webinars. And so that others may engage with you, simply change where you're sending your chat message to, to all panelists and attendees. Who knows? You might just meet your neighbor. Diane DeLuca, the senior biologist uh, responsible for orchestrating this, uh, this series, and I will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A and stopping to answer uh, questions um, at the end of the presentation. 
I've also set the parameters of the Q&A so other attendees can see all the questions that are being asked and can comment or upvote the question that they want to see in the event that we have more questions than we have time for. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Diane to introduce this evening's presenter. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm excited and honored to have Dr. Jerry Skinner join us as tonight's presenter. Jerry is recently retired as Professor Emeritus from Keystone College after 38 years of teaching all sorts of biology and after 30 years as the resident naturalist at the Nature Conservancy's Woodbourne Preserve in Northeastern Pennsylvania. He describes himself as an ever curious naturalist, always finding something to learn about mother nature. This journey has taken him to study fish, birds, marine life, salamanders, and insects. Most re recently, is he has become a real mother. He identified more than 660 species of moths in his Pennsylvania backyard. Recently, having moved to Ithaca, he can't wait to participate in New York's third Breeding Bird Atlas project. On a personal note, Jerry is a valued and esteemed mentor of mine. I was lucky enough to work alongside him as part of the teaching staff at the Hog Island Audubon Camp in Maine. Tonight, Jerry will share his expertise on moths as he explores their beauty, diversity, important ecological role and pollination duties, and gives us his insight on how to observe and participate in moth-related citizen science projects. A big thank you, Jerry, for being here. Good evening, everybody from Ithaca, New York tonight. Cool, rainy Ithaca, New York, uh, as Diane said. Um, I've only recently moved here from Northeastern Pennsylvania, and that will play a role in some of the things I'm going to share with you in a little bit. Uh, right now we're looking at a screen of tropical things. This is just my placeholder until I bring you into the presentation. There we go. So the, the title of the program is Becoming a Mother. I don't know that there's another name for people who do moths except calling them a mother, not a mother, that's used in a different way. So just when the caterpillar thought that the world was over, it became a butterfly. Could be changed to just when the caterpillar thought the world was over, it became a moth. You didn't know that moths were poets, did you? So just the fast facts before we get into some pretty pictures of things. Uh, there are about 165 species of butterflies and moths that belong to the order of insects called the Lepidoptera. Uh, it's estimated there may be as many as 500,000, many species yet to be known. In the U.S., 11,000 species of moths compared to only 844 butterflies. Lots more moths than there are butterflies out there. I'm going to give you some stats from Pennsylvania because I'm essentially a Pennsylvanian. I was there for 30, more than 30 years. Pennsylvania has reported to the uh, website called Bamona, the Butterflies and Moths of North America, more than 2,200 species of moths in Pennsylvania and 159 species of butterflies. New Hampshire, I looked it up to check, has recorded 819, has uh, sent to this website, Bamona, 819 species of moths. In Susquehanna County, a northern tier county south of Binghamton, I, uh, in my backyard, as Diane said, identified 666 species of moths just in my backyard. But as Diane said, it's a little bit of cheating because my backyard was a 650 acre nature preserve of the Nature Conservancy with some, uh, a lot of old growth forests and swamps and open fields and in other words, a good diversity of habitat. So the bottom line, Moth species greatly outnumber butterfly species in the world, yet most of us know so little about them. We've got, these were all species that were uh, photographed from my backyard. There are some spectacular ones. And yes, there are some little brown jobs out there. No, there's a lot of little brown jobs out there. So what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? And the bottom line, first of all, is not very much. But there is some difference. One thing is, is that butterflies usually close their wings when they're resting. Moths, most of the time, have their wings open. In butterflies, the antenna are long and thin. In moths, they can be short and very feathery looking, especially in the males of some things. 
We think butterflies are mostly active during the day. I'll tell you, I've caught some at night. And we think that usually moths are active at night, but there certainly are some day flying uh, moths too. I'm gonna show you this next one just isn't true. Mo butterflies usually bright, moths usually less bright. Oh, you'll see some examples of that. There's differences in what the pupa does. The, in butterflies, the pupa is naked. We call it a chrysalis. In moths, the, the uh, cocoon is usually encased inside of some kind of a silken case, or sometimes it's underground in a, in a chamber under the ground. So there are indeed some differences. One thing they both have is their body is co entirely covered with scales, not just the wings as I'm showing you here, but the entire body is covered with scales. You can see here they overlap like shingles on a roof. And many people think it's an old wives tale kind of thing that if you uh, touch them and you get the, the, the scales, the powder off of their wings, that it'll damage them. Uh, that's not true at all. If there ever was a naked moth or a naked butterfly that had lost all of its scales, all that you would see is, is a butterfly with transparent wings, a dark body, and it could fly just as well anyway. They don't really need them. What they're for is the color. Well, they don't need them. The color provides species recognition, provides some of them with protective coloration. So yeah, it's important though. A lot of people, including my family, say, are you serious? Why are you studying these boring little moths? Boring? I take issue. They take issue with that. The atlas moth, largest in the world, 10 to 12 inches wingspan. That's probably bigger than the picture that you're seeing on your screen right now in real life. The white witch moth, also as much as a foot across from wingtip to wingtip. That's not boring. And you think moths are dull? Well, the Madagascar sunset moth really would argue with you about that. It's as easily as colorful as our brightest swallowtail butterflies. It even resembles them. The tropics, of course, have their beautiful things, their beautiful birds, their beautiful butterflies and moths, but so do we. Many of us will enjoy the hummingbird moths in our gardens uh, uh, as the summer progresses a little bit. This one is sipping on a butterfly bush. Uh, these things, when they're born, they've got uh, fully scaled wings, but they lose some in certain patches on their wings to make them a clear wing moth. Smaller, really, than a hummingbird, but they're doing the same thing. Look at that proboscis sticking out of its snout, heading down the throat of that flower. One of the most common moths we have is one of the prettiest the rosy maple moth. Leave your porch light on some night, you'll probably come out the next morning to find one of these beauties out there. The eel moth is one of my favorites. Uh, as well as being colorful and interesting and wowing, um, they've got a defense mechanism here. If they're sitting with their wings closed and they're disturbed by maybe a bird, a bird would be predator, they can pull their front wings back, exposing these big eye spots and maybe just maybe they'll fool some silly bird into thinking they're looking into the eyes of a big predator. They've even got highlights. Look at that white line highlight in their eyes that gives the impression of like reflected light off the pupil of an eye. The imperial moth, another big one. I haven't seen one of these in some time. I hope they're doing okay. These pictures, by the way, many of them were taken by Bob Mole, a Pennsylvania photographer who specialized in insects and moths. Unfortunately, Bob has passed away. He's left a legacy of some of the most incredible moth pictures out there. The giant leopard moth, another beauty that we can find, you can find in your backyard. But indeed, not all publicity is good publicity, despite what Hollywood would tell us. Uh, there are some moths who have um, maybe not got such a good reputation. The death's head moth is a group of moths. So if you look at its thorax, Maybe you can imagine seeing a death head in there. Now, these were made famous and popular in the movie, The Science of the Lamb, The Silence of the Lambs. West Virginia, around the town of Point Pleasant, has got their own, 
well, this is their version of Yeti, Sasquatch, the Jersey Devil. I don't know what you call it in the New Hampshire mountains, but this was supposed to be a 10 foot wingspan, red eyed glaring creature that was reported in about 1970 or so. Uh, frankly, uh, they've turned this into a festival now. It's their excuse for how to pour maple syrup on pancakes and sell it to the public at the festival. And some of them do have appealing features. Most people are familiar with the woolly bear caterpillar. Uh, did you know it turns into a moth? Uh, a pretty one, but not all that flashy of a moth. Uh, some of the lore around these guys is, is that the width of the color bands on the caterpillar can predict the intensity of the coming winter. Baloney, that's not true at all. Uh, that's a function of uh, when was their last molt and how old that caterpillar is. So sorry, they're not predicting winters for us. Oh, talk about bad reputations. The clothes moth. I don't know about you, but I've had many bad meetings, not with these, but with their work on my wool sweaters. Uh, this is one that where the caterpillar actually does feast on the fibers of wool. Uh, they're a dull brown moth, as you saw before. Uh, I don't know about where you are, but where we are, uh, this is a kind of a bad year for the gypsy moth, another one who's got a bad reputation, an introduced moth, not native to North America, uh, a defoliator, and uh, these things, this is what they look like uh, when they're adults. We have the female on the left, the male on the right with the big feathery antennae. That's one way you can tell sex is on these things. And on the right, a female uh, laying down an egg mass on a tree trunk. The older ones amongst us may remember the days when we used to peel back an ear of corn and find a worm in it. Well, that was before BT corn and other things and spraying with lots of pesticides, but that was caused by the ear corn earworm moth. You don't often see this anymore. Apples have been attacked by the codling moth, another bad actor out there. And then there are some other good ones. The silkworm moth of the Orient, now it's been uh, attempts to have been made to try and introduce it into this country, not too terribly successful. Uh, this moth, and there's its caterpillar, and there's its cocoon. Uh, one of the most interesting things I find about it is that cocoon is made up of one continuous strand of silk. And when people harvest that, people take that and by hand unravel by turn by turn to get one very long strand of silk that was laid down to make that cocoon. And some of our favorites that we have around here, here's uh, a munching Luna, cat, Luna moth caterpillar, which in a while is going to have eaten enough that it goes into the pupa state and eventually becomes the fantastic Luna moth. Still luckily pretty common around here. Oh, this is a boy. Look at those feathery antennae. Some caterpillars are extraordinary. This Promethea caterpillar is as big as your thumb. It's got colored tubercles on it, and it shows us some things. You can see that he's got uh, uh, the head end of this is on the right side. We've got the mouth parts pointing down, three pairs of legs, four pairs of claspers, and then there are some claspers on the left side, on the left end too. Uh, by the way, caterpillars have one job. They are eating machines. No, they have two jobs. They're vegetarians. So when they eat all of the vegetation that they do, well, there's a lot of fiber in that. And so then they poop an awful lot too. Uh, it's called frass when they do that. Promethea caterpillars are going to turn into one of our giant silk moths. Still fairly common around here. The Cecropia moth, another silkworm moth, has got lots of colorful tubercles on it with spines sticking out of it. I have handled these. I've never given them an opportunity to let me know whether or not those spines are stinging spines or not. They're extraordinary looking creatures. Cercropias, so as other moths do, uh, obviously have to get together and mate. When they do, they make eggs into a caterpillar and eventually into a cocoon. Uh, here is their cocoon of silk with um, a pupa case inside. If you were to dissect one of these, you would find the pupa inside this thing. 
uh, and eventually, of course, hatching into the lovely adult. Let's take a look at a little of other aspects of natural history of the moths. Some of them live in extraordinary places. I bet many of you have seen leaves on a variety of plants that have got this funny kind of network on them. Uh, these are caused by insects that are tunneling through the leaf. They're called leaf miners. Uh, some leaf miners are uh, beetles. Some of them are flies, true flies. Some are saw flies, and a lot of them are moths. And there's my, okay, there's my cursor. A female moth will, they're tiny moths, by the way, will land on it like maybe, uh, where's my cursor? Okay, there. This might be the beginning of a tunnel. It's where the tunnel is smallest. And if you trace it along, I'll let you trace it the rest of the way, if you can. I think eventually it comes over here. Hey, it's bigger. Well, the caterpillar has gotten bigger. And as he keeps getting bigger and bigger, eventually he will pupate and emerge. And that wasn't supposed to happen. And I think that this one right here is the place where it cut a hold of the surface. And after it was done eating its leaf sandwich, it doesn't eat the top epidermis nor the bottom, just all the stuff that's in between. And then it emerges and it might emerge as one of these. This is one of the leaf miner moths. These are very tiny things, maybe less than a quarter of an inch in length, but they can be also quite pretty. Not all moths can fly. This one is a porcelain gray moth. It's the female. Sometimes females are wingless and can't, cannot fly. Some of them live in odd places. Um, there's, it's well known about uh, mothers that every plant that we have around here is being feasted on by one or more species of moths. I mean, every one. Poison ivy, for instance, has got, I know of at least two moths that specialize in feeding on poison ivy. Some moths are generalist uh, caterpillars. They can eat on a number of species. The black duckweed moth feeds only on duckweed. Some of these aquatic moths have actually got gills for breathing, taking oxygen out of the water. Imagine how big this moth is if it's feeding on duckweed. Most of us know how big duckweed is, about the head of a pin, and that's the larval food for these things. So moths, though, are juicy tidbits. Lots of things like to eat them, both the adults and the caterpillars. So what can a poor little moth do to not get eaten? Well, one thing you can do is look big and bad. This is not a wasp or a hornet or a bee. This is a European hornet moth. It's introduced into the United States, North America, uh, and by the way, in New England, it's been introduced. I don't think it's too terribly widespread yet, but this kind of mimicry where it really resembles a stinging insect, uh, believe me, that would be enough to make me think twice about trying to catch it. Others hide. Lower left here, we have a picture of the goldenrod uh, gall moth. Many of us know about the galls on goldenrods that are caused by flies and they make the nice round galls, but this stem of goldenrod in the upper left has got just a slight swelling to it. And if you were to cut it apart, you might find, well, if you can see there, uh, it's up here, is the caterpillar. And this is a used pupil case from one of these things. So these can hide from predators by being inside of a covering like this. Coloration, of course, is one. These are the world famous pepper moths. One of the examples, best examples of natural selection. And it comes in two colors. On the left, the dark gray form, which is marvelously uh, hidden on this dark gray bark. And on the right, the light form. Both forms are present all the time. But as you can imagine, natural selection in this case is favoring the guy on the left. He might be ignored. The guy on the right, he might be lunch. How many moths can you see in this illustration? Well, probably you're picking out this. And maybe you're picking out this. But these dead leaf mimics can be really tricky. Look at this one down here. It's got spots on its wings 
that very nicely match these decay spots on the leaves that they're found on. So hiding in plain sight is one way that they can avoid being eaten. Caterpillars too can hide in plain sight. Which of these projections is a caterpillar? Well, the one on the left is a twig. The one in the middle is a twig mimic. If you look down where it attaches to the rest of the branch, you can see some of the legs down there. One thing about these caterpillars is if they move, they're more easily seen. So things like this porcelain gray moth, uh, they assume this posture during the day and then they move around at night. And by doing so, this would fool me, I, I can tell you. Some moths and caterpillars take a more aggressive defense. For instance, I've only found one of these. I found one of these monkey slugs just last year and they're covered with stinging hairs that uh, will make you sorry if you get in contact with one. Besides, this is certainly the least handsome caterpillar I've ever seen. In the upper left, we have the spice bush swallowtail uh, caterpillar. Uh, here's one that is a snake mimic. And again, this guy could fool me. If you irritate this guy, he picks up his head in and waves those big eyes and, and snout around. And in the lower right, no, that's not bird poop on that branch, uh, but that's what it's supposed to look like. This is a giant swallowtail, it's a butterfly, giant swallowtail caterpillar. Can you pick out the caterpillar that's resting on this leaf? This is a moth caterpillar, and you can see that, uh, I'm sure you can pick him out, but right down the middle of his back, he's got a dorsal stripe that is a great mimic for the venation on this leaf. And all those feathery things on him there, those are stinging spines. You don't want to mess with this guy either. So how do you find moths? Well, the easiest way is to have them find you, have them come to you, attract them. And the easiest way to do that, you could just leave your porch light on overnight and go out late at night, you know, an hour or two after dark, you might have moths flitting around. You could take pictures of them with cell phones. They get cameras these days on phones can give you some great pictures. And I'll suggest what you do with those pictures in a bit. Or you can leave them on all night and just get up in the morning and go out and see what's still there. <clears throat> you may wonder why this picture is here. This is a picture of a, of a bathroom at a state park. This is where I first started studying moths. When I was doing my dissertation in southern Ohio on a lake, uh, we lived at a state campground and I was interested in moths at the time and I pursued being a mother by going up to the restroom windows. Of course, the inside the restroom, the lights were on. That attracted moths to the windows and so I hung out around the windows of the bathrooms at night. And yes, I did have to make some quick explanations from time to time from uh, campers who wondered what was going on and occasionally to a park ranger. I got some great moths though. If you want to get a little bit more aggressive going after moths, black lighting is a great way. Uh, hanging out there is a black light on, in front of a white sheet. And uh, this black light is, is easy to find. You can get them at Walmart. You can get them at Spencer's Gifts. I still had mine left over from the 70s when I used them to light up the psychedelic posters in my dorm room. But those same black lights are very attractive to moths. Uh, they give off ultraviolet radiation that for some reason attract moths. I've never had as good luck as this particular picture is showing, but I have attracted a great, matter of fact, I attracted almost all of the 600 plus species in my yard to a black light that I hung off the back of my house. A little more aggressive is using an insect trap. These use a black light that's suspended over a funnel that uh, drops the insects down into the bottom of a bucket or into a preservative that you go out and get the next morning. These are likely to catch more moths than just plain using uh, a black light by itself. The one advantage is you get a lot of other nighttime visitors to it when you're doing black lighting from the buffalo uh, leaf hopper in the upper left to some beetles upper right that have got some amazing antenna on them. 
a mayfly lower right, and another kind of a boring beetle in the lower left, uh, sometimes some amazing things will come to your sheet at night. Sugaring for moths is a time-tested way to find them, to attract them. And sugaring means making up what some have called um, a witch's brew. Um, it's a really pretty amazing mixture of things that you make. You notice in the back left corner, there's some, some wine that works very well. You need some of that. Um, a good stale flat beer works wonders. Uh, I see a jar of honey or molasses works well. Uh, a couple bags of brown sugar there, and then lots of fruit. Oh, but not just fruit. When I went to get fruit for my moth, my witch's brew, I would go to my local grocery store, find the produce manager and say, can I take a look at the fruit that you threw out yesterday? The stuff that's got the fruit flies flying around and is too soft and gushy to use. It's the overripe fruit that really works well. You take that fruit, throw it in the blender. Uh, not too much though. You want to have some chunks uh, mix together the sugar, the wine, the beer, the molasses and all that stuff put it in a bucket, put a cover over the top of it. Oh, I forgot, yeast, because you're gonna wanna convert all of this sugar into uh, an alcoholic brew. That's what does the trick. You're really gonna give these moths a buzz. I would set this out in the sun for, oh, at least a week or so to let it get good and fermented. And then you go out and you paint the trees with this during daylight and then after you've made that major route of 10, 20, 30 trees that you have painted, you go back and start at the beginning again and look to see who's attracted. And certain moths who are less likely to come to your black light are more likely to come to the brew that is mixed that is on the trees. Especially, uh, it's very attractive to the group of moths that are called the underwing moths for obvious reasons. And especially if you've got chunks, this is chunks of peach. Oh, they really like that a lot. <clears throat> and we see we have two different underwing moths here, one with orange and black coloration and another one with rose and black coloration. So you pull out all your, all your tools to try and bring these things in. You might even use a little trick. And that little trick is an ultraviolet, a black light flashlight. Well, let me tell you the story with this one. <clears throat> I had a class in Costa Rica, and at night, one night, uh, one of the women in my class screamed. I hurried over to her room, and there was a scorpion walking on the sidewalk outside her room. I was prepared for this. I was actually expecting something like this to happen. I raced back to my room and got my ultraviolet flashlight went down, and we turned off the flashlights that were the regular flashlights that were illuminating it like this, turned on the black light and holy smokes, these things glow an eerie color under black light. And so we take this and apply it to the Lepidopterans and we find that there are some caterpillars that glow amazing colors under black light. These are some of the slug moths. Uh, the, two, the two top ones are slug moths, the left and the top on the right. Uh, they've got the stinging spines on them, but for some reason, uh, who knows what the reason is, uh, these things will glow in the dark, a hornworm glowing in the dark. Uh, so sometimes I have gone out after dark with my flashlight shining up in the trees in my garden, looking to see if there's anybody glowing back at me. Well, once you get them, how do you go about identifying them? Well, some are easy. Some are big and gorgeous and beautiful and frankly, not that hard to tell. But as you recognize, there are a lot of what we call LBJs, little brown jobs, and they, they take some study. So of course there are books for them. The Moth book is uh, an old book uh, from around 1900 or so. W.J. Holland wrote it. it was the first really good one like this. It's still available and frankly, it's still helpful. And for instance, it's got the recipe in it for how to go sugaring for moths and a wonderful description of how to do it. The second book, The Peterson Field Guide to the Moths, is the new version, uh, and it is uh, very good. It's by Beale and Seabrook uh, Leckie. Uh, it's got uh, several thousand moths, but it can't have everything, because remember how many of them there are. Uh, I use this one more than anything else. Another one to Caterpillars and the first edition of the Peterson Moth Guide, again, still useful. 
in Pennsylvania, who was lucky enough that there was a Butterflies and Moths of Pennsylvania Facebook group. I don't know if New Hampshire's got one or uh, if Massachusetts has one, but this was very useful. I posted a lot of things up here. I, I posted things I was proud of. And I also posted many, many things <coughs> that I didn't know what they were. And the neat thing is, is frankly, people, there are a lot of moth nerds out there, more than you can believe. And you could post things up here and say, can someone help tell me what this is? And usually it was something I'd never seen before. And I knew it was something new for my backyard. And uh, almost always, I'd say at least 95% of the time, one of those people out there would recognize what it was and post. And then I could go look it up and go further with it. I can't say enough about iNaturalist. I bet many of you know about it and use it. If you don't, it is a wonderful tool uh, that is, uh, 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 has become um, a bulwark of citizen science for all things, plants, animals, butterflies, moths. And it's something uh, where you take a picture with your iPhone, in my case, or your, cell, your smartphone, and you submit it to the website and it uses artificial intelligence to figure out what it is. This one is not a moth, but it's my example for tonight. This one landed on my car a couple of days ago, and I took a photograph of it, cropped it, cleaned it up a bit, and then I submitted it, oops, then I submitted it to uh, iNaturalist, and so you see there's my photograph up there at the top, and uh, down at the bottom is what we call the metadata, the date, the time, the name of the place and the latitude and longitude exactly, all the details of where I got it. You'll see what that's for in a bit. And then I clicked on the middle button where it says, what did you see? And it uses its artificial intelligence to say, and it comes back pretty quick, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Chrysopolis. And then below it says, and here's what we really think it is. And the very first choice here is the golden black snipe, golden backed snipe fly. And that indeed was the insect that I had found. Uh, so the next thing, the button doesn't show, but down at the bottom of the screen at that time, there's one that says share. And when you press on that button, it uploads your picture and your data to the enormous uh, uh, data set. With now they've had more than 1 billion uh, records submitted to iNaturalist. And then the data set is available to anybody. I could go look up the snipe fly and see who else has seen it. Where have they seen it? I can look up uh, everything that's been seen in Pennsylvania. I can look up specifically what's been seen in my county. Um, and, and then other people will look at it, some of those other insect nerds that are out there. And they will look at it and say, yes, we agree with you. It is a golden back snipe fly. And that makes you feel good. They might say, they always do this nicely, we disagree with you and here's what we think it is. And then you have the opportunity to go look up and read about what uh, they have identified. And you can come back and say, yes, I agree with you, I was wrong. Or you can say, no, I still think I'm right and here's why. This is a wonderful tool. And if you haven't used this yet, I encourage you to download it to your phone and go out and take pictures. Once you get past that though, the really, really difficult thing is to identify them is by using the moth genitalia. And here's why, that sounds kinky and weird, but here's why. Um, many moth species look very similar and there's a fair number that cannot be identified from a photograph because there are what we might call sister species that look so close that we can't tell them apart, but their genitalia is unique. And that's because when male and female get together, they fit together like lock and key, and they have to be a certain shape in order to work. And so a oh, species, their genitalia has got a certain shape to them that works only with others of their species. And so this is the absolute true way uh, next to DNA to tell whether what something might be. And people have uh, identified, this is a left and right view of, uh, of uh, some of the genitalia. I've not tried this yet, but uh, I know that there are a fair number of species. I was sometimes frustrated when the experts would tell me the species that I had, you can't tell it from its sister species without looking at its genitalia. 
So here are some more resources for those of you who might want to become Mothers. Well, the top thing there is a link to National Moth Week. Yes, there is such a thing. It's coming up July 17th to 24, 21st, I think, is National Moth Week. And if you go to this website, <clears throat> and this is being recorded, so you can you don't have to write things down now if you find something interesting. You can go back and visit later and you pick up these addresses. National Moth Week can give you information. For instance, they encourage people like me to do demonstrations. So when I lived in Pennsylvania, I did. Every year during National Moth Week, I would uh, invite people to my backyard uh, to see my black light sheet and also take them down into the woods and, and sugar up the trees and see what we could find. Maybe you can find one of them that's near you. The middle link is to a website called the Butterflies and Moths of North America, BAMONA. Uh, this is one to which I submitted all the records from my backyard. And you can look up uh, your state, your county, to see how many species of butterflies or moths have been submitted for your area. And you can submit new records. I submitted many new records. Uh, as a matter of fact, my, back, my county in Pennsylvania had there was no one else who was doing it. So I submitted 600 plus records that were, you know, new records for the county that no one else had done. <laughs> now I live in Ithaca, Cornell is here. It's maybe one of the most entomologically studied places in the world. Uh, I'm gonna have trouble coming up with new records around here. Another identification site that's helpful is the Moth Photographers Group. Yes, really. There are people out there who specialize in taking photos. You've seen all the wonderful photos I've been showing you. And uh, they post them along with discussions about them and they can help you figure out what it is that you have got. More resources. Bug Guide is another place where you can find pictures of everything, but this is broader. This is for all kinds of insects, not just for butterflies and moths. Uh, in the middle is the Facebook group I mentioned before. You might look to see if there's one in your state. And at the bottom, Bioquip, this is the company in the West Coast that sells, will sell you all the equipment that you need, whatever you need, whatever you want, dealing with insects, how to catch them, how to identify them, how to do anything with them. Bioquip is the place to go to get your equipment for that. Today, I was introduced uh, I'll tell you in just a minute, uh, to a, a wonderful presentation online. And they referenced this one, uh, a YouTube series called Do-It-Yourself Entomology Series, done by a Cornell person. And these are five of the topics that are shown in YouTube, vid YouTube videos that can show you how to get started, how to build a trap to catch nighttime insects, and if you really want to get into it, how to do a genitalia dissection. And the program that I mentioned that I saw today that I want to share with you because it was an extraordinary presentation by Dr. Jason Dombrowski of Cornell. The Moths of the Finger Lakes, don't be put off by the Finger Lakes part because much of it will apply uh, also to uh, other areas of New England. This is an hour and 13 minutes. It's at a, a higher level uh, academically than I presented to you, but still very listenable. And when I listened to this, I sat and thought for an hour and 13 minutes, wow, Jerry, you thought you knew something about moths. This is what a professional does. Dr. Dombrowski is a professional uh, entomologist and you will learn lots by taking a look at this. So think about National Moth Week. Maybe you'll wanna try and find a demonstration near you. It's worth it. It was interesting when I first started doing moth demonstrations at the preserve in Pennsylvania. Um, I published in the newspaper, the, you know, in the one of the activities things and what you, what you can do this weekend. And one of the local radio stations picked it up and they were just having a great time making fun of how, how hopeless do you have to be? No friends at all. You're, here's something you can do. Go to a moth presentation. I called them back up the next day and thanked them. I had an overflow crowd of people who came out to see moths that night, the biggest group I ever had. So at this point, 
I'd be happy to answer, to try to answer questions for you if you have anything that you'd like to ask about moths or mothing. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jerry. That was great. So here are a couple of questions. Um, someone asked if moths and butterflies are in um, different phylogenetic groups. No, they, of course, they're all lepidopterans. And actually, butterflies are a, an offshoot of one line of moths. So it's actually moths are the parent group from which butterflies came. But the fact is they're all very closely related within the group, the Lepidopterans. So um, here's a couple of other, is the moth, are the moth populations declining? 40 plus years ago when we moved to New Hampshire and driving at night on our country roads in Deerfield, it was full of moths. Today there seem to be much fewer moths. Uh, you're an astute observer, and that's exactly the example I was going to give you. Uh, people of my age frame, we, we remember what it was like driving at night and how you had to clean your windshield regularly because of all the insects, the moths, that would hit your windshield at night. And you're right. Frankly, that's a rare occurrence these days that your windshield gets messy from these things. Yes, moths and all insects are in decline, some would say, precipitous decline. One amazingly interesting study that was done in the, uh, in the uh, United Kingdom uh, estimated based on radar studies uh, from oh, 40, 50 years ago um, or more up to the present time, the biomass of moths, of night flying insects in general uh, that were flying and migrating, many European species migrate, and they have found that there is a, a stupendous decline in uh, night flying insects. So indeed, uh, there are far fewer than there used to be. Jerry, can you talk a little bit about moth and butterfly conservation? Well, um, habitat problems is the biggest problem that these things face. We know that some species are very highly, they're obligately dedicated to their host food plant. You know, a good example would be, we all know that monarch butterflies eat, eat milkweed and nothing else. Milkweed goes away, so does the monarch butterfly. Well, that's true of some moths too, uh, that feed only on one or a few closely related plants. So as the host plants go, so go the moth species, the butterfly species too. On the other hand, there are some that are generalists. Uh, the generalists who are willing to eat lots of things, have a varied diet, they're more likely to survive because they can switch off. Other things that have impact, well, for instance, well, I mentioned the gypsy moths in, uh, uh, in the discussion. Uh, around here in Pennsylvania, it's not uncommon in, in uh, outbreak years for uh, the state agencies to uh, fly over spraying insecticides to try and control the outbreak of the gypsy moths. Um, gypsy moths, by the way, are rarely fatal to trees. Yes, it does happen sometimes, but it, um, a tree that gets defoliated by uh, gypsy moths, if the tree's in good shape, it will come back next year. Uh, if it happens a number of years in a row, and especially if the tree is already stressed by another disease, by drought, uh, something else, uh, then yes, it might cause mortality then. But spraying for gypsy moths, um, you know, if you spray a, a, a broad spectrum insecticide, it's going to kill lots of other non-target insects. If you could get something that would kill just lepidopterans, then it would kill gypsy moths and every other moth and butterfly out there. So there are some things that are sprayed. We try to home in on the target species, but it's really not possible to have a, a spraying that is going to affect only one thing. So some people think that some spraying for forest insects, for instance, have killed off many of the, the giant silkworm moths, the Promethea and those kinds of things. Uh, some of those very large moths are the things that are uh, targeted by night flying birds, things like uh, whippoorwills and uh, Chuckwill's widow and nighthawks. 
And we have also seen a decline in nighthawks, which some have attributed to a decline in, in their prey base. So there are indeed endangered species of moths and butterflies. Um, we know, obviously we know less about them than some of the other bigger, prettier things that we love better. But yes, indeed, there are, there are many conservation issues for these insects. Is there anything that you might recommend for people who are interested in um, promoting or conserving these in their own backyards or areas? Yes. Um, <laughs> the program that I uh, highly recommended to you by Dr. Dombrowski, his number one answer to that question is, is reduce the size of your lawn. Um, keep what you really want to have but let it, the rest of it grow back nature, uh, to, to native status. Uh, this is a, the idea of the loss of habitat business. If you want them in your backyard, do plantings of native species. Uh, indeed, there are some species that are more moth friendly than others. Uh, moths, for instance, if you think about it, you know, the, the tie in with the pollination businesses, some moths indeed are pollinators, uh, but you might be surprised to know that moths are maybe more attracted and maybe home in more on white flowers. Uh, at nighttime, moths really can't see the beautiful colors that we see during the daytime. What they can see fairly well is they can see the white of the of white flowers that have got tubular throats that they can use to stick their proboscis down. Uh, so planting those kinds of things is helpful. Uh, a garden full of uh, things that bloom sequentially especially if they're natives. Those are some of the things that you could do. Thanks, Jerry. There's, there are a couple of specific questions about gypsy moths. So what is the current status of the gypsy moth in the US? Are they now endemic in Pennsylvania and Connecticut? Um, and is the USDA releasing sterilized male gypsy moths to try to control the populations? Uh, well, the first part, uh, what was the first, repeat the first part, Diane? What is the current status of the gypsy moth in the U.S. and are they now endemic in Pennsylvania and Connecticut? Oh yes, they're here to stay. Uh, one thing about uh, introduced species like that is the, uh, the way to keep them out is to keep them out. Don't let them get introduced in the first place. If they, you do find an introduction, uh, go after them tooth and nail at the beginning. You might have a chance of, of getting rid of, rid of them then, but uh, at this point, the gypsy moth is here to stay. Uh, they do wax and wane. Uh, there'll be some years when you won't see many. There'll be other years I've been in the woods and it sounds like it's raining because of all of the frass pellets, that's poop, that is uh, being rained down by the hordes of gypsy moths that are up in the canopy feeding on the leaves. So they do wax and wane. And, and as with everything else, the, there are certain things that the, regulate their populations. They are susceptible to fungi. They're susceptible to bacterial and viral diseases. Uh, cold, wet weather is no friend of them. It promotes the fungi that take them out. So there are things that, that can have an impact on them. Uh, regarding sterilized males, I've, I've not heard of that. I'm not an expert on it, but I've not heard of that. Mostly what I hear of is spraying with the pesticide BT and, uh, and some other things that try to, uh, uh, to home in on uh, gypsy moths and just a few other species. Jerry, do you want to just say um, a couple more words about BT? I'm not fresh enough on it to, to be comfortable with that. Okay, just say it's a biological control. Yes, it is. <clears throat> it's bacterial. BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, and uh, it's a bacterial product that uh, uh, that works on the caterpillars. Uh, here's a here's a question about parasitoids. Do you also study parasitoids of the moss caterpillars? I'm fascinated when I find caterpillars with cocoons or other signs of parasitoids. I don't study them myself, but I I, I am somewhat familiar. And uh, when you read about how many parasitoid wasps there are, and parasit parasitic flies, tachinid flies. It, it's a wonder that any of these caterpillars survive. 
uh, so many of them are attacked. I, uh, at one point, I, I like to go out and collect monarch butterflies and uh, uh, bring them in and raise uh, the caterpillars and raise them indoors. And I was surprised at how many times I have a, a fly emerge or something else from them. It really is, uh, it, and it's, you know, we shouldn't um, uh, denigrate these parasitoids. They're just doing what Mother Nature uh, made them to do. This is how they make their living, but they make their living by parasitizing and being parasitoids on, on uh, caterpillars and such. The idea is that a wasp, um, it doesn't sting, but it, um, it injects its egg either on or inside the caterpillar's body. Uh, when the, uh, the, 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 the larval form of the, uh, of the wasp hatches, uh, it will eat the insides, usually the non-vital organs. They try and keep the host alive as long as possible, but eventually they do kill it. And uh, it, it is an amazing thing. The way all these things are interconnected with each other, it really is astounding. Jerry, here's a couple of specific questions. Here's one about moths that eat clothes. How do they even get into my closet? Where do they come from? <laughs> I found a small whitish moth in a closet this week hiding amongst my clothes. I don't know necessarily that was a clothes moth. Uh, you really have to wonder how they come in. Uh, they do get in maybe from the occasional open door window or something like that, or, or maybe not very tight window systems, but uh, they do. I, I rarely see a moth, did see a moth in my old house, but they just feasted on my sweaters. Uh, and my rule of thumb, be, my rule of thumb in general about wildlife is: I love you outside, but you are not allowed in my house. And any moth I saw in my house, if I could catch it and release it outside, I would. But I didn't have any compunction about trying to save my my sweaters from further damage. Here's another um, story to share. I found a polyphemus caterpillar in September and put it in a butterfly house with a maple and oak leaf. It pulled the maple leaf up, wrapped itself in it and made a cocoon. I left the butterfly house outside all winter. It hatched yesterday during the rain. I let it out of the tent last night and put it on a table with raised sides. It couldn't fly. It just flopped around a bit. It was a female. I let it be and looked for it this morning and it was gone. Do you think it finally flew or could a predator have gotten it? Well, either one of those things uh, could have happened. Um, should you have that happen again, something that you might try is if you have a, um, um, a screen cage box that you could put them in, a female, uh, that female will um, let the boys know that she's available. Uh, they, she does that by releasing pheromones. And this is a common way that people use to catch uh, the, the, the males of the species is by a, a trapped female who gives off pheromones on a, uh, under ideal conditions. Uh, it's been shown that some male moths can detect a female's pheromones from as much as a mile away. And they fly upstream into a stronger and stronger scent current of these things until they find the source. Uh, you could conceivably come out the next morning uh, and find four or five males hanging on the outside of the cage, just wishing they could get inside for a date. That's a great story. Um, I should ask, if, are there any other questions that people would like to share in the Q&A? If I could jump in and ask um, a silly question. You, you, Jerry, you said in some of your, um, your slides, you're like pointing out the male having the antenna, but why do the males have the antenna, the feathered antenna and, you know, how do they use them? Well, the, the feathered antenna give them a, a very large surface area on the antenna and their antenna is, uh, they're very, uh, they live in a very chemical world and their antenna is the way they taste and smell the environment. So when those males are, are picking up the females' pheromones, it's based on that. They're using those antenna to find them. Female antenna are typically 
um, long, thinny, thinner, much skinnier, uh, usually distinctly different from the boys. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Well, if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank you all for your attention tonight. I invite you to turn on your porch lights and go out in the morning and see what you have in your place. Then take a picture of it, get it identified on iNaturalist, and send it into the big data site. Be the one billion and one record that goes into iNaturalist. Jerry, one more question popped up. What kinds of moths will be out in February, March visiting sap buckets on maple trees? <laughs> well, there are some winter moths, believe it or not. Uh, the general rule among flying insects is that the air temperature has got to be at least, no, not the air temperature, their, their body temperature has to be at least 45 to 50 degrees uh, before they can fly. Less than that, they cannot fly. So what some moths do to fly in cold conditions is they shiver their flight muscles, the biggest part of their muscles until they raise the temperature of their flight muscles and then they can fly around until they cool off again. So there are some moths that are known to be winter moths and there is one moth species in particular that is known to be attracted to sugar buckets in the springtime and sometimes you can find, I, I, it slips my mind what its name is, uh, but I bet if you google moth and, and maple syrup you'll find something about this. And I've seen uh, one, once or twice, I've seen buckets that had, uh, oh, just a lot of these moths in it. Doesn't do anything to affect the, the syrup, but uh, maybe, it, maybe it, it looks surprising. Thanks, Jerry. And there are lots of comments about what a great presentation, how much people enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Thanks for the invitation, Diane. And thanks to you. This was great. Really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And Call Mark. Again, yeah. Yeah. Um, the last thing um, I'll like to add is I'm going to drop some things into the chat. Um, the first of which is a feedback survey. Um, and those of you who are not yet members of New Hampshire Audubon, there's a, a link directly to join if you like this presentation. Um, your support allows us to do work like this and, um, and bring experts from around the country right to you through these webinars. And then finally, um, it's the link to the rest of the series talks. And so you can register for future talks and also watch past um, talks that have been recorded. And um, a quick note, um, we do have, um, for those of you signed up for next week's um, uh, presentation about nocturnal uh, am I reading that right? The nocturnal pollinators um, that got that got moved to July 27th. You should already have uh, an email in your inbox saying that that date has been moved. Um, so we do have a new presentation in our lineup um, that I invite you to um, sign up for, and that's "Where Have All the Monarchs Gone?" by Donna Miller um, from Petals in the Pines, um, which will be a very interesting. Um, presentation. I'll drop the direct link to register for that right here in the chat. And that's all I have. Thank you again, Jerry and Diane, um, for an excellent evening of learning. And thank you all for uh, tuning in with us. And we hope to see you at another webinar here in the future. <laughs>